I know what a nice API looks like and I know that I want to use um, nice, useful, powerful abstractions uh, in all of the software that I write. And if I have to write a parser, that includes parsers. I don't have to write a parser, by the way, but it's fun. Um, so what's a parser? Um, this is a fairly uh, common formulation of a parser, in functional programming at least. So in its essence, the parser is a function from a string um, to a maybe, so a result type that encapsulates failure. Um, a, which is the type of the value that we want to try and parse out of the string, um, and a string, which is the remainder of the input. So basically, take a string, um, if the parse fails, you get the value nothing. If the parse succeeds, you get the value just, uh, and then a tuple of a value of the type, which is um, the type of the parser, and the remainder of the string. And then you wrap all that up in a new type, so that you have the data constructor, data constructor parser, which is applied to a function value of this type. That makes sense to people? Okay, yep, all nods. Anyone doesn't make sense to? Okay, good. So this is, a, this is not the only, um, far from the only actually, formulation um, of a parser, but it's a common one when you're dealing with simple parsers and uh, educational exercises. So uh, this, is a, this is my data type for my program that I'm interested in. Oh, I might vary, I might mix it up and talk, talk on this screen. In the side of the room as well. Let's move this large object. Um, so we had a thing. What's a thing? Uh, I don't know. I just made it up. It's, it's just a thing that contains an int and a bool. Um, and there are uh, there's a serialized representation of this um, in a string. So I'm going to say that the serialized representation is just a decimal. Oh, a decimal um, positive integer, we don't care about negatives, um, followed by uh, a lowercase t or a lowercase f, representing the true or false for the bool that's inside the thing. So 555t and 7f are valid serializations of our data type, and not valid you know, t true and 5 because it's in the wrong order, or 7 space f because our um, our syntax doesn't handle spaces. Again, just completely made up arbitrary serialization. Um, now, if we assume the existence of these two parsers, <coughs> excuse me, parseint, which has the type parserint, and parsebool, which has the type, that's what the double column means, parsebool. Um, I haven't included any uh, implementation of those for now. So we're just going to assume that those are defined. And um, this is how we might want to define our um, parser thing. So parse thing um, has the type parser thing. Parse thing is defined as the data constructor thing, and then some glue. And we'll put the parse int in position here, which is the um, first type parameter for thing. And then some, some more glue, and then pass glue. So this is sort of the, sh the general shape of the API that we want. Um, glue is not an actual function. Um, but this is how we're actually going to define the parser. So I'm going to use um, this function here, which is pronounced fmap, and is indeed um, just the infix version of fmap, and um, this guy right here, which is called you know, Starbuck or whatever you want to call it, um, you can pronounce it apply. Um, so this is the API we're going to implement. Everything makes sense to people now? Okay, good. Um, now, to write this parser, there's a few abstractions that we're going to need to implement for our parser type. So just to introduce these, um, as you may not already be familiar with them, um, the functor class 
um, basically is a container or a thing that can be mapped over. So there are bajillions of things to the functors, including passes. Um, so the, um, the function, the single function um, defined by the functor type class is fmap, which takes a function from A to B, and it takes a functor of A for some concretion F, because this is just a class, um, and returns a functor B. So basically, it turns the um, A's inside the functor, or in, that relate to the functor, um, into B's using the function that you're given. There are some laws associated with all of these type classes. Um, for a functor, for example, it's not allowed to change the shape of the structure. Um, and fmap with the identity function must produce the same value and so on. The applicative functor um, gives you a bit more power, but there are a few instances. Um, it has the pure function, which takes a single value a and lifts it into the um, applicative functor context. So it just takes an A and returns an FA. So an example of this might be a list, um, and you can call pure with a value of type A, and um, the, that's going to evaluate to the singleton list, a list of one element containing that value A. Um, with the maybe functor, um, it would be just to wrap it up in a just. So you take a, you get a numbers, you take a uh, number one, and you get back just one. Um, here's our friend apply that we saw in the API that we want to write. Um, this one takes uh, a functor containing or with a value of the type A to be self function type. And then it takes another FA, or takes an FA. And if both of these are valid values, for example, for maybe if these are both just, then it's going to apply the function inside the first F um, to the A here and return F B. You also have these um, kind of left and right versions of apply. Um, there's no function involved here, there's just an A and a B. So it basically runs this computation and runs that computation, but discards the result of the first computation. And then similarly, the left pointing one runs both computations and throws away the result of the second comp computation. Um, these have default implementations in terms of uh, apply. So we don't actually need to um, write definitions for these, but we are going to use these functions. And finally, alternative is an abstraction that gives you choice. Uh, so this um, angle pipe fellow, you can probably pronounce that or, or choose between or something, um, takes two FAs where F has an instance of alternative which requires an instance of applicative, which requires an instance of functor. Um, and if the first one fails, or falls through, or whatever that means, um, for the particular type that you're implementing the alternative instance for, um, then it will fall through to the second. So in case, in the event of parsers, this is a way where you can take two parsers, and you can say, try the first parser, and if that fails, try the second parser. Okay. So we're going to implement um, all of these abstractions for our parser. And then we come to some combinator functions, right? So these are functions that you can use to glue different parsers together to create a more complex parser. Now, you can use the, um, the applicative and the, and the alternative functions to do this. Um, so here we have um, the choice function from alternative. Um, many also comes from alternative. This one takes a parser A. Or it takes in, well, it's defined in terms of alternatives, so it takes an FA and returns an F list A, where F has an instance of applicative, but um, specialized to the parser type. You would take a parser for A, and it's going to return a parser for list of A. So it's going to try and parse as many as it can out of the input um, in a row and return a list, which could be empty if it fails for. Um, many one is similar, but it will return non empty A. This one, um, there's no abstraction that gives us this for free. We're going to define this in a minute. 
And then you can, you've got things like set by, where you can define a parser for a separator token, and it will pass a list of A's separated by set, or attempt to pass. And between, you could use for parentheticals or quotes by giving it a parser for a left token and a right token, and a parser A for the thing that you expect to find um, inside the delimiters. And there's a whole bunch of other things that you can define. We're not even going to define all of these today. But uh, this is just to give you an idea about um, how um, parsing combinators work. The idea of defining small, simple parsers and then using these com combinator functions to assemble them into a parser that actually does something interesting. So um, we're going to write some code. Is everyone cool with what we've seen so far? Yeah. OK, sweet. Whoops. Uh, right. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, what was the color scheme command? Someone? Set so, so BG equals light. Set BG Oh, dark. Oh, dark. Oh, yeah. oh, no, that's light. It's light. Yeah, that's a thing that I. Oh, what the heck? No, <laughs> hang on, hang on. Hmm? No, it's on stage. It's fine. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I reckon. Syntax cursor lines. Yeah, let's. Get rid of that guy. Yeah, I think I just... Okay, that's... Yeah. That's okay. Is the, is the green too light? Is that coming through? It's or, fine on the camera. It's fine on the camera? Is that fine for everyone in the audience? Nope. I can see if I can make it a bit darker. <clears throat> if you just flip back to BG Live. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Set BG is light, was that it? Yep. Okay. okay. Whoa. How's that? That'll do. That'll get us over the line. Hopefully. Okay, so um, here's some doc test examples for uh, for our parser parsing, um, which we've defined here just as it was in the slide. So parsing is thing that map parsing to apply parse bool. Um, we haven't defined parsing and parse but we'll do that in a moment. Um, here are some doc tests, so we're just going to make sure that, you know, if we run parser parsing string 555t, that's going to give us back just um, thing 555 true and an empty string because there's no more input string left. Um, t555 will be nothing, 7f dot dot dot, and um, we'll return thing 7 false and the remainder of the string dot dot dot. So these are just examples to make sure that the parser we define is probably doing the right Why thing. Why would you not be able to put an integer at the end of that? Say you've got 7f7. Seven seven. Oh, yeah, yeah no, that second 7 will become part of the string, would it not? Yeah, so that will work. And the, because it will attempt to parse the thing, the parse will fail when it does not encounter a, um, a lowercase t or an f. Yeah. So the remaining input then will be seven dot dot. Yeah. yeah. And so I could change that now, just to prove that I'm not completely full of it. Seven F seven, and then the remaining input should be seven dot dot. I can't go away. Yes, I know. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. So um, yeah, if we dot test this. Fine. Oh, that's, yeah, of course, that's not the comment character for VI, is it? Um, the that's right, I'm not going to change it now. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're getting these errors parsing and parse rule are not defined. Um, we're importing parser here, so we're going to open up uh, parser.hs. Um, right, here's our parser definition. You type parser A as parser, um, applied to the function, 
um, with the field man run parser of the type string to maybe tuple a string. Uh, okay, so let's now define our first simple parser, which will be called satisfy. What satisfy does is it takes a function from a character to bool and returns a parser character. Um, what it's going to do is, if the first character in the string is satisfied by this function, this test um, character bool, then that's going to be a successful parse. The uh, value, the care value passed out of the string will be the character that was tested, and the remainder of the string will be the remainder of the string. So satisfy is digit empty string will be nothing. Um, satisfy is digit high will be nothing because H is not a digit. And satisfy is digit 99 bottles of beer will be just nine, and the remainder of the string, nine bottles of beer. So uh, satisfy uh, test, so we'll call the function value that we receive as an argument test, and then we'll say uh, uh, is defined as the parser data constructor applied to a function receiving a string, which we'll call s, and then we'll do um, case s of, so we're going to do a case analysis on the string s. If, the, if s is an empty string, we will return nothing. And if s is non-empty, will be structured to the first character of the string C and S prime, the remainder of the input, which may be empty. Uh, then we'll do if um, test C, then just tuple C S prime, or else nothing, because the test failed. And now if we run our doc test on this file, as a symbol A, so this is referring to the um, symbol A. This is the next part we're going to define the symbol. Um, two, three, so examples five, try four, so the first three passed. The second simple parser that we're going to define is called symbol. It's going to take just a character and return a parser for um, just this character. So if the first character of the string is this character, then that's a successful pass. Otherwise not. So we can use the satisfy function to define this. Um, so symbol C is defined as satisfy equal to C. So we're calling satisfy with function that tests the quality of this character that it pulls out with the character C that it gets given. That makes sense to everyone. And so now we can run the doc test. Examples 5, try 5, so those functions are, well, they're passed in the doc test. I won't go so far as to say they're correct. Uh, right. So if we want to define, um, is, uh, we want to define parseBool, right? So parseBool has the type parseBool. So parseBool uh, is defined as uh, we can use the symbol combinator. Uh, symbol T. Now, if um, symbol T is a successful parse, we don't actually want the character T that was passed out. We just want to know that it was a successful parse. And then we want to move on and return a uh, parser for the value true, which has the type bool. So we're going to use this um, write apply <coughs> chat that I described as part of the uh, or, uh, as part of the equative type class. So we say we can run the single uh, run the parser single t. If that parser is successful, then we're going to return this parser here, which is um, a parser that returns the value true and consumes no input. Um, of course, that only handles one branch, the true branch. So we're going to use our choice function from the alternative type class. 
and do the same thing for the false case. So symbol character F, and then pure true. No, uh, false. No. <laughs> pure false. <laughs> um, okay, and so now we get it's complaining. Uh, we don't have an instance of alternative. Um, and we can define that, but only after we've defined an instance of applicative for parser. And we can only define that when we define an instance of functor. So let's start with functor, and we'll work our way back up. Uh, I'll do it yeah. So, instance functor parser where fmap f um, e. This is a function from A to B is the parser equals or is defined as um, parser, which is applied to a function that takes a string and uh, what happens next? We want to uh, run parser ps. So this is going to get the um, maybe result of running this parser with the input s. And then we can use the fmap instance of the maybe type to apply um, this function f to the a that's inside the maybe. So inside the tuple, inside the maybe. Um, we'll use the function first to do that. So what first does, you can import it from data by functor, and this is a more general version, which you should do if you want to use first rather than defining it yourself. But in our case, we're dealing with tuples, so basically it takes a function from A to B and a tuple AC returns a BC. So it's like F mapping over the first part of the tuple, hence the name first. So we can um, first F, um, F mapped over run plus PS. Okay. and need to write the applicative instance. So here we have two functions that we need to define. The first one is pure. Um, pure A is defined as, so what pure does is it takes um, just a plain old value A and um, in the case of parsers, it's going to return a parser that always succeeds um, with the successful parse result of A and consumes no input. So I say parser applied to a function that takes in a string s, and then we're going to um, have that value to just a, which we got from the input, and s, going to have the uh, unchanged input. And then the second function we need to define for applicative is apply. In this one we take um, two functions, P1 and P2. The parser result of P1, if successful, is going to be a function from A to B, and P2 is going to have an A. We're going to apply the function from the first parser to the value from the second parser. So again, parser data constructor applied to a function that takes an S. We're going to use the do syntax um, for the uh, in the maybe monad. So the first maybe is going to come from uh, running the first parser with the input s. We're going to run parser uh, p1s, and we're going to find that as um, f and s prime. Okay, and then the second part. Um, we're going to pull the A out um, and bind S double prime, run parser P2 S prime. So this time we're going to run the second parser with the S prime that we get from the first parser, if that succeeded. And um, if this parse succeeds, then we're going to get an A out and S double prime, which is this remaining input after running both parsers. And then we can just return. Um, tuple F A, so apply F to A, and S double prime. Excuse me, phrase. I don't think yep. we can use return. 
we might have to use pure. Ah, yes, indeed. Return might be going away. So we can use pure, which is um, more abstract. You don't have to. It's working on maybe. So oh, true, true. Yeah, sorry. <coughs> I don't know. I, I take that on board. Um, <laughs> we can use pure. Or indeed, um, because we know we're in the um, maybe not add, then we can do just and be very concrete. But perhaps that's more useful to people who aren't necessarily familiar with um, monads as an abstraction. Okay, so finally we have the alternative instance to define. So instance alternative parser, where um, here we have two functions to define. The first one is empty. Um, which is going to be a parser that always fails. So here we can say uh, empty is defined as um, parser const nothing, because we really don't care what the string that comes in is. We know we're always just going to fail. And um, p1 or p2, so the choice between p1 and p2. Um, so here we can say it's. Uh, Parser data constructor applied to a function that takes an S. Going to run parser P1S. This is going to give us a maybe. Maybe has an instance of alternative. So we can use its choice function. So if this parse fails and returns a nothing, then we're going to do run parser, if I can spell it, P2S. OK, and it compiles. Um, but we're not quite done. We've only defined parse bool. We still have one more parser to define. Just parse it. So parse it is defined as. We're going to use some more combinator functions here. Um, so we, we know we want a non empty run of integer, decimal integer characters. And then we're going to turn that into an int. So we're going to use the many one combinator, which again we haven't defined yet. Uh, many one uh, and then satisfy is digit. So the satisfy is digit, you'll recall, will look as a parser for a single character. That will succeed if that character is a digit. So many one is going to return a list of one or more characters where those characters are digits. Then we need to actually turn that into, so this will be uh, a string, essentially, or conceptually. We do need to turn that into an int value. So um, here be dragon, we're going to use read and toist. F mapped over the result of running this parser. We know that read will succeed because we will have a non empty list of digits. But read is a partial function, and you should always um, be extremely cautious when you're thinking about using that. You just use read maybe? Um, yeah, you could use read maybe. Because it can but still fail. You, you need to bind that, and I'm not writing a monadic parser today. Um, but yeah, otherwise you could. Okay, so we need to define many one. Do this. Um, oops, that's not what I want to do. We're going to do um, data dot list empty. So the uh, many one combinator is going to return a non empty list because that is just a more principled thing to return for a list that you know is going to be non empty. Um, so the non-empty data constructor is this chap here, the, um, well, I don't know what you call that, column pipe or um, expression or space or whatever. Um, so it takes uh, a value of type A and a list of A's. This list may be empty, but the overall non-empty will always have at least one value. So you cannot construct one without an A. Um, make sense to people? Good. Okay. So uh, many one is going to be 
um, taking a parser A and returning a parser non empty A. This function to list, by the way, is going to take that non empty A and turn it back into a list, which is what read expects. So many one um, P for the parser uh, is going to be expressionless face fmap p apply many p. So again, we see this correspondence with the um, type of the non empty data constructor where we have a p in uh, which is an, uh, an applicative or has an applicative instance, and many p, which is going to be the list. Again, um, parser, so having the applicative instance, which means we can use these functions um, to construct a parser mini one um, in a way that mirrors the data that it's actually going to construct if the parser is successful. Okay, so we'll flip back to the thing and run the doc test, and there you have it. There's our parser um, doing its thing. And we've done that from scratch. Any questions about what we saw in the live code? Yep. Because there are some new people here that may not know some things about Haskell, with the parse bool, mm. doesn't that mean you're running that parse at like both branches of the parlor and wasting some computations there? Like when, when you're going true or false? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, you're only going to run, you're going to run this first branch first. Only if this fails are you going to run the second branch. If you have some parser where you know that 99% of the time it's going to be an F, then it might be a sensible optimization to switch the order. But yeah, generally it's only going to run this parser because Haskell is a lazy language. So you know values are only, expressions are only evaluated as called for. So it'll attempt the first parser first. Um, if that succeeds, it stops there. Otherwise, it runs the second parser. Cool. Okay. So what if the input type is not a string? What if it's a text, which is a packed character representation? Um, that's something that the parser that we just defined doesn't handle. Or what if the piecewise input type is not a character? but a word 8 and you're dealing with a byte string, either as a list or a data dot byte string byte string or a vector of word 8s or whatever. In these cases, um, should you have to use a separate library or a separate module in the library to define your parsers? Most parsing libraries do require you to, well, do either make an opinionated decision to just be a string parsing library, for example. Um, or we'll supply different modules that you can use to define your parsers according to which of these cases um, or which combination of those cases apply to you. But um, you don't actually have to do that. Um, you can write your parsers in a, in a generic way. Um, that can work for all input types and uh, all piecewise types that you're dealing with, whether it's character or um, word 8 or, in this case, an amino acid. GATC, which is the DNA things. I'm, I'm not a biology person. I was just looking for an example that had a very small alphabet, um, and DNA came to mind. So we have a type A list for DNA, list for amino acids. We're going to pass the hacker gene um, out of some input DNA string, which is not a string, but a list of amino acids or a sequence of amino acids. So pass hacker gene is going to be a parser. Here we have a new type variable, a uh, new type parameter for parser. Uh, which is going to be the whole input type. And then um, the type that we're going to pass out, not empty of any way. Um, we're going to define pass packaging as many one. So a run of one or more, symbol A or symbol C. Why A and C? Because they're hexadecimal digits and G and Z aren't. Totally contrived right example, but um, you know, we might want to write a parser to do this or something similar to this. And we are not working with characters or bytes. And we might also want to have DNA um, in a list, as we have here. But what if we have a vector of amino acids or a sequence? Or 
or some other some other sequence type. Um, so we want our parser to handle all kinds of inputs as well. Because why would you want to repeat yourself and have to define um, a whole other parser just because you need to deal with vectors and um, lists? I don't like repeating myself. So um, there's a the abstraction cons, which comes from um, control domains, because of course it does. Um, so cons SSIA. Here S is the whole type, um, and A is the it's wise type. And anything that has an instance of cons has a relationship defined between the S and the A. So the S is going to contain things of the A's in sequence. The function uncons um, takes an S and returns a maybe double A S. This may begin to look somewhat familiar to you. And there's a whole bunch of instances that you get for free just by importing control.lens.cons. So you get it for byte strings and word eights, both lazy and the strict versions, and same for text, same for text and character, um, both lazy and strict text. And you get it for list, list A with A. Um, just pretend those Bs are A's and it all makes sense. They, because the Bs and the A's can be the same type, but this lets you do some other cool things, but we're not actually going to need to do that. And then, you know, vector A's, and the A is contained inside the vectors, and there's a whole bunch, there's like 10 other instances that you get um, just by importing control.lens.coms. Um, so we're going to use this abstraction to um, refactor the parsing library that we just wrote uh, to be more general. Um, so parser now is going to have the second type around the S. Um, and the run parser function, or the field, is going to have the type function from S to maybe AS. And as an example, satisfy is no longer a function from uh, function capable to parser A, but a function from, so taking a function from A to bool and returning a parser SA, where there is an instance of cons SSA A. That makes sense to people? Is anyone completely lost? It's okay if you are. So basically what this is saying is our, our satisfied parser now, or our satisfied function that can construct the parser, instead of taking a character tool, it just takes an A to bool, so it's abstracted over the piecewise type um, of our input. And it returns a parser SA. Um, so don't worry about the S type parameter, it just means that for anything where there is an instance of cons SAA, so if we go back to the, go back a, where was that? Here. So here are the instances, right? Cons SSAA is byte stream, byte stream, word A, word A or text, text, pair, pair, or list A, list A, list B, list, uh, list A, list A, 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 um, which is strings, because a string is just a type alias for list pair. But it could equally be a list of word eights, so a list of bytes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, where are we? So this new satisfy is basically general over um, any combination of types for which that um, cons instance is defined. So if you're going to write a parser using this function satisfy, um, depending on what the type of the function you, you give it is, depending on the concrete type, it'll work for um, any input that has that concrete type A, or has a, has a cons instance relating that concrete type A, with a collection type containing the A. Make sense now? So yeah. the cons basically means whatever an A is, we can extract tokens from it. Yeah, we can uncons it, that's right. And that's what that function uncons does. Yeah, what's the um what's the significance of having two collection types and two uh, like atom yeah. types in cons? Yep, good question. I don't know exactly. Okay. Um, 
<laughs> it's an Edgar Matt thing. So, um, yeah, I can't answer that question okay. in, in, in any useful way for you at this point. Um, you could, you could, from this point forward, just imagine that there's one S and one A, cons S A. Yeah. Yeah, because you can see that there are instances where A and B are different, but in our case, even where we're using this instance, the, the types are the same. I, th I think that things like non-empty use the second parameter for saying the first thing is a non-empty, but then when it returns, it returns a list after that point. That's where that becomes useful. Yeah. It's the it's the return ah, type of the, okay. the re, it's the rest. It's the type of the rest, which is not exactly the same at all times. Yeah. Right. Okay. okay. Some of the lens machinery, the return type can vary from the input type. And there's probably an uncons for maybe that returns unit for the return type because there's no other value. For instance, <laughs> that's why it exists. Cool. All right. I don't remember seeing the uncons for maybe, but you might be right. But I might have missed it. It could exist. It could exist. It, you could, could write it. It could exist yeah. for that reason. Interesting. <laughs> It'll just be unit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, let's go refactor our library now. Let's actually do this. Um, so I'll open Amino. So here we've got Amino as defined uh, in the slide. And our doc test for pass packaging. Now we're going to use the new formulation of parser with the additional type variable for s. Um, cons ss, so we're saying for any s where there's a relationship between the whole type s and the piecewise type amino, which is g or a or t or c. Um, to do this, you actually have to enable a language extension called flexible context. Um, and then, as we saw on the slide, this is the uh, definition of the parser. Now, if we want to run this, we're going to have to go back to the parser module and change all of the things. So we'll add the language extension, flexible contexts. Okay, so parser A becomes parser SA, and string becomes S, and string becomes S. Functor is now defined for parser S. This is a quick div and alternative. And it should all be fine. Satisfy now changes from Ketable to uh, A to bool parser S A. And as the type class constraint uh, cons SSAA. Symbol um, takes an A and returns a parser A with two type class constraints because we're using equality here. So we need both a cons SSAA. And an eek a. Pars bool. Now, again, the concrete type um, for the piecewise type here is care because we are explicitly dealing with characters in this parser. Mean is um, on the single one the parser side. Thank you. Uh, so here we have um, parser. S S K K as the type class constraints like cons. Oh yeah, cons. Of course it's cons. Cons S S K K. Uh, many one becomes parser S A. Um, parser S non M D A. Parser int is parser S int again because of the is digit function. We're dealing explicitly with characters of piecewise type. So here we need type class constraint. Um, cons SS care, parser S int. Uh, oh, yeah, we need to import control.mains.cons. Okay, what's happened here? Oh, yeah, 
and to totally we need to completely rewrite this function um, <laughs> because we're not dealing with lists anymore. So um, we want to do, uh, actually we can use do notation for this. Uh, we're gonna try and pull out a C and an S prime, although C is not necessarily a character anymore, but we'll just continue using that terminology from uh, uncons s and then we're going to say uh, if test c then just c s prime else nothing pretty much what we had before okay no errors found and now if we flip back to the thing we'll look back to this one as well um, we're going to need flexible context too as well and parse thing is just going to be parser s thing. And because we're using parse and parse bool, which deal explicitly with character, as the piece points type, we're going to need a cons um, ss care care in the context, which means we're going to need to import control dot capital A and s dot cons as well. And that's good. So we're going to run our parser here. And that's still all good and we're going to run our doc test on our amino acid parser here and that's all good so now we have a nice very general um, parsing combinator library a very small one and not a very efficient one so we'll talk about that now um no, actually we'll, yeah i'll talk about that now go to the next slide so design considerations in parsers um how are you going to deal with ambiguous parsers if your grammar has ambiguity um, a naive reformulation of the parser type that we had will just see you using a list rather than a maybe. So the list gives you the option of still returning zero possible parsers, which would indicate a pass failure, but you can return a number of possible successful parsers with the remainder of the input for that parse. Um, incremental input, do you want to be able to feed your parser input incrementally and get um, better guarantees around uh, memory usage. Um, and it depends on how you want to use it as well. For example, if you're going to be parsing data that's coming on, uh, coming in chunks off a wire, um, it might be a very desirable characteristic of the parsing library that you use for that to be able to feed it chunks bit by bit instead of accumulating all of the input and then feeding it to the parser all at once. Um, errors in recovery, so how are you going to report parse errors? Please don't just return a string, that's very not useful at all. Um, but you might want a way for people who are defining parsers to use their own domain error types and have the parsing library um, produce those when the user-defined parsers fail. Uh, or you might want some mechanism to be able to recover from errors, so ways to inject behaviour um, into the parser to say if parse fails at this point, um, run this function, do some sort of analysis on, on where you are in the parser, what the input is, perhaps there's some sort of common mistake that we might have to recover from, like a missing semicolon at the end of the line, if you're interested in those sorts of languages. Um, so again, yeah, it's just another design consideration if you're choosing a parsing library or writing your own. Performance considerations, backtracking. Um, if a branch of your parser fails, um, to be able to backtrack means you need to do that bookkeeping, and there's a cost to doing that. Some parsing libraries, um, by default, when you're using the um, choice function from alternative, don't do that bookkeeping deliberately unless you explicitly tell the parser to do so using a particular function. And that trips a lot of people up. Um, when they're using those parsing libraries and expecting it to have done that bookkeeping for them. You know, the naive approach to alternation says that um, you would run it with the input and if that pass fails, you're going to run it with the same input. But no, actually many parsing libraries um, consume the input on the first branch unless you tell it not to. Continuation parsing style is a common um, performance optimization for parsers. I don't really know a lot about it or how to do it. If you do, or if you want to learn about it, I think that'd be a pretty cool talk to come and tell us about continuations and um, how to CPS a parser. 
and transformers if you want to be able to um, perform effects um, through the process of parsing, then you're going to need your parser to be a, a um, monad transformer to do that. Looking at the Haskell parsing libraries, um, Parsec, and also its recent fork, very recent, only a week or two ago, I think, was the announcement, which is someone decided to fork Parsec and actually maintain it and make a few fairly small um, design changes to it. So Parsec um, is a monad transformer, or you can use it as a monad transformer. Um, it's mainly designed for parsing programming languages and kind of human-friendly structured input. Addo Parsec, on the other hand, um, oh, it needs to parse the whole input at once as well, Parsec. Addo Parsec, you can feed it chunks. Um, it uh, doesn't do a lot of bookkeeping. It gives you really terrible error messages, and it's kind of designed to um, fill the niche for very high-performance parsers who are mainly going to be parsing um, you know, wire formats, so serializations produced by machines designed to be read by machines rather than humans. Uh, Trifecta is the complete opposite end of the spectrum, and uh, it's designed to give you like syntax highlighted errors with the input, so it's, it's a nice one for um, programming language source code and that sort of thing. UU Parsing Loop, UU stands for University of Utrecht in uh, the Netherlands. Um, it's conceptually the closest to what we did today. Um, so it uses a type class called list-like, which basically gives you the same um, capabilities as control.lens.cons. So taking a slightly different approach, um, but yeah, I think it's interesting and I wanted to include it because it's conceptually the closest, you know, well-known Haskell parsing library that people do actually use to do real things, um, closest to what we've done uh, in the talk today. Parsers is a kind of unifying interface, so it gives you a type class, or actually a number of type classes for, um, for parsing functionality, and instances are provided, <coughs> excuse me, for Addo Parsec and Parsec, but you could um, provide the instances for your own parsing library as well. So if you want to provide parsers for some format, for example, that you're interested in, or some custom format that you're using um, at you know, make a call for wherever you work, um, you could define your parser in terms of the abstractions of the type classes defined by the parsers library. And then you can use that parser with Atto Parsec or um, Parsec or whichever other parser has instances of those type classes, which means that users of your parser aren't forced to use a particular concrete parser implementation. Um, or you can choose which one you want to use according to your performance considerations, for example. So it's act it actually doesn't, um, this isn't a parsing library, it's just a nice kind of distraction over parsing libraries. But it gives you some flexibility in terms of which actual parsing um, you want to use. Uh, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, yeah, Parsec also has a, um, uh, a token mode. So you can parse the input into tokens and then parse the tokens into what you want to do. So, sort of corresponding to the whole um, lex then parse paradigm. Um, which, if you want to do that in Haskell, by the way, you can use Alex and Happy. Happy is the parser generator, Alex is the Lexa. So they take a grammar specification and produce Haskell modules defining the Lexas and the parsers for that grammar. Um, other resources are the functional Perl, monadic parsing in Haskell is a good read. Um, it uses the, uh, the list formulation, so it's the parsers that it presented in this paper handle um, amb ambiguity or um, non-deterministic parsing. Invertible syntax descriptions are an interesting research area where they're trying to unify parsing and pretty printing. So you just have a, um, a single specification and that is used to um, construct or to run the parsing or the pretty printing for a particular format. Um, 
this page, there's a few implementations of this, and including Boomerang and Roundtrip, um, and the invertible syntax, other libraries. And uh, the paper includes a number of custom abstractions. So I think it's a really great idea. It's an idea whose time has come, but I think we're still waiting to see the, um, the ideal implementation. And um, Prisms, Lenses, and other optics. I'm slightly interested now in seeing how far you can go in terms of defining passes, in terms of prisms from string to some other type that you're actually interested in, from some input type um, to the internal types that you want to work with in your programs and libraries. Um, I haven't really looked into that, but I, I think it's an area that I'd like to go deeper into. Um, and if that's you as well, then yeah, do that and then come and give a talk about it. Uh, it's fine until you want nice error messages. It's fine until you want nice <laughs> messages, right. So you'll be giving the talk on that soon. <laughs> looking forward to it. Just don't want uh, errors. Yeah. That's the end of my talk. Um, are there any questions? Did anyone completely not follow what I was doing? It's okay, like if you didn't, don't be embarrassed. You're like, it's okay. It probably just means I didn't present the material as well as I could have. Um, did ever, everyone feel like it went, like they followed through and <laughs> thought it was valuable? Isn't it like antique compiler, compilers that we used to have? Like flex and bice and that sort of stuff? Yeah. You tend to do this thing where you have your kind of your BNF description, and you mm -hmm. have a little chunk of the code, like, okay, now I've defined these, these two, you know, tokens or whatever, and I then write a bit of code where I construct a little bit of the, the abstract syntax tree, or you know, whatever data type I'm constructing. Can you do that? Can you kind of pass, like, little, little anonymous functions and slowly build up your thing? It's, that's just not the way this is done. It's always my fault. Well, for parser combinators, the way it's done is it's the way I've shown you basically. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Parsec has the option to do one kind of run of Parsec to produce all your tokens. Yeah. And another one using those tokens as the input stream. Right. Because he was talking about dividing the, the lexicon phase. Yeah. Although well, Alex and Happy is more closer to the yeah. lexicon bias. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Ray.